Uh, I see a couple of uh, distinguished guests here this morning. Former Congressman uh, Michael Harrington is here. And uh, Michael, we welcome you. And also uh, former Congressman, another legend of the past here, uh, <laughs> former Congressman Bill Delahunt is here. And I have to give a little commercial to the congressman, because you'll say after, <laughs> uh, the congressman is being honored uh, this Sunday uh, with a very, very special recognition. A week from Sunday. A week from Sunday? Yeah. Okay. I was going to come this Sunday. I was going to come this Sunday. Uh, uh, the Dedham uh, Courthouse is going to be named after former state representative, former district attorney, and the former member of the United States Congress. Quite an honor to say the least because this is where he spent most of his career in the, in the law area and uh, to be recognized uh, with this very special recognition says an awful lot about who he is and it's something that uh, I know that many of you uh, have already been aware of the event and uh, we'll be there and we cheer him on because he he deserves the, uh, the recognition. So with that, let me just tell you that uh, later uh, this week, we'll be in New Hampshire for another Politics and Aches event. The governor of Maryland, Governor Larry Hogan, will be speaking to the New England Council. Later in uh, October, we'll also hear from uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island, Congressman Seth Moulton here in the Commonwealth, um, and uh, many other uh, Events will be coming up very, very shortly, and we'll let you know uh, of those. But we'll wrap up October back here in Boston for a very special, what we call New England Innovates uh, program, looking at the incredible work in our region to combat Alzheimer's disease. I think you've read the newspaper just recently, and Biogen and other uh, pharmaceutical companies are really making good progress on this uh, dreadful uh, disease. Senator uh, Ed Markey uh, will be the keynote uh, speaker for the event. We also will have a panel discussion with many members of the New England Council will participate. That will be on October 25th at the uh, Omni Parker House. And uh, of course, we're thrilled to be finally holding our annual celebration in person at uh, the Omni Hotel, which is across from the uh, Convention Center on November 7th. And um, we have four remarkable uh, New Englanders of the Year, as well as a, uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award recipient and uh, as of over the weekend, I think we have about 195 and 198 companies that have already said yes, put us down for a table. So if you add that up, we're closing in almost 2,000 people, which is extraordinary. So thank you to all of you that have supported us. Uh, special shout out to Larry Zabar for coordinating the, uh, the development uh, of the uh, annual celebration. So today we're delighted to welcome our good friend, uh, Congresswoman Lori Trahan, for her first in-person council program in Boston since the pandemic. And uh, she was kind enough to speak to our members in DC a few uh, months ago. And she also holds the distinction of being the only member of the New England delegation to address our members virtually while also quarantining in her own home with the case of COVID back in 2020. If that's not dedication to the New England Council, <laughs> I don't know what is. The Congresswoman is serving her second term in the United States Congress, but in just a very short uh, few years, truly established herself as a leader on a host of important issues for our region. After serving on the Armed Services and the Education and the Labor Committee during her first term, she earned a seat on the influential House Energy and the Commerce Committee last year and has been a champion for access to affordable health care, tackling climate change, protecting kids online, and fighting disinformation. We are so pleased that she could join us this morning to update us on all of her good work that she has done on the issues that she's been advocating on and her priorities as the 117th Congress quickly nears its end. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to the Honorable United States Representative, Lori Trahan. Okay. Okay. Right. 
Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be back in person. Um, it presents a lot of challenges on a Monday morning for you know me to. It won't, won't I compare that to uh, um, zooming in from my home because I still have two young girls, and uh, if you could just picture the the chaos. It's surprising that I'm even here before you uh, right now, but it's, uh, it is. It's lovely to be here, and thank you for allowing me to uh, still speak, even though I had COVID back in my house. You provide me a lifeline to the public, which I think you all know if you've quarantined for those eight days, ten days, I forget even how many it was. Um, it was grim. <laughs> it was grim to be uh, in those spaces by yourself. Uh, but to say that a lot has happened uh, since the last time I spoke at this breakfast uh, would be an understatement. What's clearer than ever is between your know, recent Supreme Court decisions, uh, un incredible federal investments in manufacturing and, and clean energy, and the peaks and valleys of our uh, economic uh, times of the past few months, is that our nation is certainly at a, at a crossroads. And looking ahead at the next five years, even the next 10 years, our region does have a tremendous opportunity in front of us. While many states across the country have worked to rewrite history and to take away rights rather than uh, progress rights, we've mo moved in the opposite direction. We've moved forward here in Massachusetts. And that's why Massachusetts, just like all of New England, has historically been a place where people want to live, where they want to work, where they want to raise a family, come to, for school. We're a region that looks uh, at, at what's happening with women's rights in Republican-controlled states, and we take action to protect women and healthcare providers. We're a place where labor rights are more than just a checkbox, where they're the gold standard here in our state, and we're a place where innovation and manufacturing has fueled our nation's advancement uh, at every turn. So it's not a coincidence that when my Brazilian grandmother came to the United States 80 years ago, she moved right here to New England, uh, to Lowell, Massachusetts, and she chose to come here for the reasons so many did. Uh, it was a place where she could find work uh, as a mill girl and she could create a better life for her family. And generation after generation uh, before us have seized on this opportunity to give people like my grandmother that chance. Right now, we have a chance to do that once again. In the past year, Congress has taken up and passed unprecedented investments that help our region and our nation lead the 21st century. Investments that'll help us not only compete, but win on the world stage. So I'll just run through a few of them, even though I'm sure all of my colleagues have done the same in, in, the, in, in the weeks uh, before I got here. But projects funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law are in full swing. Uh, just last week, I was in Lancaster, a you know, small town in my district that is getting intersections at two um, critical corridors outside their elementary and their middle schools. And these projects are going to reduce the likelihood of accidents that have plagued uh, this small town uh, because of unsafe signage, narrow streets, no sidewalks. It's going to make it safer for students and parents to cross the street. Uh, and just like you know, the Rook Bridge in Lowell, for those of you who are familiar, the Basilier Bridge uh, in Haverhill, so many other projects across the region, we wouldn't have gotten it done without the infrastructure law. So excited to see those investments continue to flow to our communities over the next five years. We didn't stop there, as you well know. We passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is going to reduce uh, out-of-pocket costs for families on everything from health care to utility bills. I am particularly pleased to report that Massachusetts and our region as a whole is uniquely situated to benefit from the climate investments in the legislation, investments that um, in clean energy production uh, like offshore wind uh, and investments in grid sustainability, which we all know is more important uh, than ever as we, as we head into the winter. And I'm especially excited to talk to you about what is in the CHIPS and Science Act that we passed in August. Uh, and I'll have to pause to say just that a lot of credit goes to our Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, uh, for her work on getting that important piece of legislation across the line. You know, it looked as though CHIPS was on life support 
uh, stuck between the House and the Senate, and she intervened urgently uh, to get it done. Uh, by now, you've no doubt heard about this long overdue law and what it's going to do uh, for our semiconductor chip industry here in the United States. And you've heard about the manufacturing facilities, the research labs, and the jobs that it will uh, create because of it. But our region stands to benefit disproportionately from this law because of the tremendous coalition of chip-focused companies that call New England home. This concentration of innovation, uh, not just R&D, but also manufacturing, means that we can establish a cluster right here, a region that combines the incredible work uh, being done in private sector uh, companies with a uh, academics at research institutions from UMass Lowell to MIT, and a relationship that breeds jobs, uh, attracts investment, and strengthens our region and our entire country. I am committed to making sure that becomes a reality, but it's going to require all of us to come together and make that case. And rest assured, I'll be calling on plenty of you uh, here today to, uh, to help with that. But with the opportunity ahead of us, I think we also have to acknowledge the tremendous challenges that we have, the challenges that risk our country moving forward, but leaving large swaths of working families behind. Inflation continues to threaten the ability of working families to recover from the pandemic and parents who want nothing more than to re-enter the workforce. Increased costs are forcing our small and medium-sized business, many of which overcame the darkest days of the pandemic, to shut their doors for good. And we know the problem with supply chain, something that we've been working on to resolve uh, for months now to help alleviate that pressure. But we also know that the consolidation in a number of industries, whether it's food, lumber, baby formula, are driving up prices as well. A few massive corporations uh, have gobbled up smaller competitors and have become the only game in town, the only game in America, as it turns out, that folks can order from. And despite the antitrust laws that we have on the books, these billion dollar companies are banking Congress, are banking on Congress to not act, not holding them accountable for price gouging that's adding to their already uh, record setting profits and doing so on the backs of of families and community businesses, and this couldn't be happening at a worse moment. Uh, as you well know, and we've all read about, uh, estimates from National Grid and Eversource are predicting that home heating and utility bills are going to skyrocket this winter, fueled by increased demand for natural gas and heating oil that is uh, drying up because of Vladimir Putin's losing war in Ukraine. But families, you know, like the one I grew up in, and I'm sure many of you, they're not focused on the cause of these price hikes. They care about the fact that they won't be able to afford an electricity bill that rises 40 to $50 a month, even 120 in some estimates. So our perspective on this must be simple. No parent should ever be forced to uh, choose between keeping their family warm or putting food on the table, period. Uh, to get ahead of the issue, Congress passed and the president signed into law already a government funding package last week that includes $1 billion uh, increase to the LIHEAP program. Some of you may be familiar with this program given the unique need that communities in New England face uh, for home heating assistance. And the fact that we got this additional funding uh, across the line before uh, demand surges is important. But that alone is not going to be enough to ease the pain of increased co uh, utility costs this winter. That's why, as we speak, we've been working uh, with my colleagues to advance proposals that will increase our ability to get natural gas and home heating oil to Massachusetts quicker and more efficiently. You know, increasing supply will lower costs and ease the burden for our families and businesses alike. And that's what we should be striving for as we continue working to transition our grid away from fossil fuels and toward green renewable sources. With the headway that we've made already, I fully expect our region to lead the way there once again. Uh, the path forward for a sustained New England dominance won't be easy. Uh, and in a different arena, the start of the pet season has, a, has proven so much. But much like the Patriots under the leadership of Bill Belichick, uh, we have the experience necessary to overcome so many challenges. And we've got the tools and the resources necessary to win. So, if you need proof of that, 
Uh, you can look at what President Biden said just a few weeks ago on his trip here to Boston. Nothing happens without the input and the sign-off of the Massachusetts delegation. Uh, you better believe that means you know, fulfilling the president's pledge to build our nation better. It's going to require Massachusetts and all of New England to lead the way. So I do want to thank you for inviting me to join you here this morning. Uh, you're all such a big part of how strongly we are positioned uh, so, so well into the next decade and beyond. And I look forward to answering your questions. That's always the most fun of this morning. <laughs> So we have a few minutes for uh, for questions. If anyone, Ira. So last week, Ira you want, from Atlanta, yeah. yes. Last week, in the continuing resolution, the FDA user fees were renewed for another five years. But all the riders that were on either the Senate or the Senate and the House bill fell aside because Mitch McConnell didn't want the burden. So there's going to be some kind of a big bill in December. Uh, do you think these riders, including those that were uh, agreed by both the House and the Senate, uh, are going to have a place in that package, and it's going to be, you know, that's going to be like the last plane out of Kabul. I mean, how how is it assured that these? We don't use that joke anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no, but so many things wanting you're, to ride. Yes, in that package. You're, you're, look the. Um, November and December are going to be very busy, and I think everyone's sort of posturing to see like where we'll be uh, after the election. I think somebody, when I came in this morning, said, uh, are you enjoying your break? Uh, and if only, if only it was a break to get ready for what will be a busy eight weeks uh, when, we, when we get back. Um, but we are all home campaigning. And basically, you know, getting the message out in terms of why it's so important that Democrats hold the House to continue these incredible legislative achievements that we've been able to get over the line, a president who works in a bipartisan way. Uh, there are, um, there is good chance, uh, and I know out of our committee, we've, we've passed a lot of things in a bipartisan way, a mental health package. Uh, certainly there are a lot of riders we expect to have you know, a, a major tax bill, uh, and I think where, you know, we're working, you know, with our chairman, uh, Richie Neal, who is, you know, heads down to make uh, November and December very productive months. And, you know, whether we pass, um, you know, we want to we have the opportunity to pass, uh, you know, a good um, omnibus. And, uh, and, but there's, there's a lot of friction there because, you know, some folks think that, um, you know, they want that chance to do in, in January because they will have been victorious in November. So we'll, we'll have to see, but we're preparing. Uh, we're preparing so that we can make it a productive session. There's a lot of things that are kind of hanging in the balance, antitrust legislation, privacy legislation, certainly uh, the riders and a, a mental health package. And, and then workforce issues. I don't have to say it to this group. Uh, I don't care what industry I'm talking to. Uh, workforce has become a, uh, a huge bottleneck for our companies, a, a huge cost bucket, um, you know, because of our inability to either um, attract workers, uh, folks who have left the workforce, maybe, you know, uh, semi-permanently, uh, maybe the conditions don't exist for, for many of the women who left the workforce during COVID to go back. Uh, to work, and so I do think that the, the Congress has an opportunity to play a role there as well. Can you just talk about the political landscape and the New England congressional delegation? There's a couple of interesting competitive races. One, New Hampshire, the first congressional. Yeah. Your colleague, Chris yeah. Pappas, has a, uh, a very competitive uh, and worthy opponent there. Jared Golden, second congressional district in Maine. <laughs> Joanna Hayes down in, uh, in Connecticut. Yeah. What are you hearing on your, your colleagues and how well they're doing? Yeah. Um, so I'll start with Jared Golden and Chris Pappas because they've been tried and tested and winning in red districts uh, since they got to Congress. Uh, they know how to win in their districts. They've proven that much. Uh, you cannot invest enough money uh, in them because they know how to get the job done. But we're getting, you know, we're getting outspent, outspent by CLF, which is the IE that runs, um, uh, you know, the Republican side. And they have that unlimited ability to just call a large donor and get a billion dollar check uh, to go to this effort. 
Uh, and that has real consequence on our elections. I mean, Jared is, he'll be the first one to tell you that, you know, they're landing punches uh, in, in, in his district. Uh, but that being said, uh, we don't need to outspend um, CLF. We don't need to outspend the uh, RCC. We are, we just need enough. Um, because these candidates are, they've got impeccable records to run on. They know their districts so well. They're in politics for all the right reasons. And so they're quite confident, um, which is terrific. Uh, this is a tough landscape to go home and campaign uh, for, especially in these, uh, in these red districts. Uh, but Chris Pappas is, uh, it, he's going to pull that out. Um, he, is, he's, his, the, he is running against a, uh, uh, a woman who would be so bad for the state of New Hampshire, New England in general. Uh, I think, I think uh, one of my colleagues was on a flight with, um, with Lauren Boebert, who was just campaigning for her, just to tell, give you a sense of where she is uh, on the conservative spectrum. Uh, and so it's, um, and I don't know, conservative spectrum doesn't even really touch on where that spectrum ends. Uh, but it's, um, We've got great candidates, and you know this isn't. I know a lot of talk is about um, history and what happens in elections like this, and the math is tough, right? I mean, you look at the 35 toss-ups, and the math is is hard. Um, but this is about the future. I think the electorate across our country understands that this election is about uh, the future of our country, and there's a lot of motivation on the Democrats and even the independent side to go out and vote so that we're putting on our uh, country on a path forward and a, a, a um, continuous improvement. Uh, and that is not what uh, so many of these candidates, uh, these Republican candidates in, in districts across the country are talking about. They're talking about going in the exact opposite direction. So. Right now, we're actually focused on Jared uh, in Maine. Certainly, uh, Maggie Hassan is doing a great job running uh, her campaign. Annie Custer and, and uh, um, Chris Pappas in New Hampshire. Joe Courtney and Johanna Hayes in Connecticut. And then Seth, uh, Seth Magaziner, we have to, we have to elect. Uh, you know, I think some of you may have seen the some of the stories of you know him being uh, his opponent, uh, Mayor Fung being a more moderate opponent and someone who could be uh, you know a stronger candidate. Um, but let's be super clear on what happens to even the most moderate of Republicans from New England or Massachusetts. They go down and they caucus uh, with Mitch McConnell or with Ke with Kevin McCarthy and Steve Scalise, and. There is, there, is no, there is no voice given to moderate Republicans down in Washington right now. We've seen their agenda, we've seen their plans uh, to put Social Security and Medicare on the chopping block, continue to talk about you know, dismantling ACA, uh, a federal ban on abortion. I mean, that would be disastrous for our country. And so there is no sending a, um, a Republican candidate uh, that may have a, a you know history of working in a bipartisan way and expecting that that's going to change the way that conference operates. Um, I work with plenty of Republicans who are, um, you know, on the sensible side. Um, they don't have a voice in their caucus. They don't have a voice. They can't get anything over the line right now. And until that breaks, until that changes. Um, we need to rely on Democrats. <laughs> Do you think that uh, after the election that the Democrats may decide to uh, address the rules reform and maybe say, you know what, we have some really young, talented people like Lori Trahan. She may not have the seniority, but it's an opportunity for her to move up and maybe given a position to leadership on a committee. Uh, how do you think they're going to push that aside? <laughs> That's a well-crafted question, Jeff. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to uh, time any sort of self-interest of mine in, in, in that. Like, I, this is always up for, for debate. Um, you know, we've got a caucus that is chock full of talent. Uh, there's no question. I mean, you probably can name more people in the Democratic caucus than you ever have before. Um, and that is testament to 
uh, the type of people we've been able to attract, the type of people that we have elected. Um, and so I, look, I really do look forward uh, to how we can progress as a caucus, how we can make it so more people see and have um, visibility into emerging leaders uh, in our party. Uh, we have really been served well, uh, especially these last four years that I've been uh, in, in the Congress, but certainly going back of the experience the subject, the expertise and the subject matter of our, you know, of our chairman, thank heavens. Um, I don't think that we would have had CHIPS, um, inflation, uh, inflation Reduction Act, Infrastructure, ARPA, CARES. We wouldn't have had that had we not had uh, chairmen and chairwomen who were ready to go and work with this administration. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we... Um, that we harness uh, that expertise always in the Congress. Uh, there are faster ways of doing things. We're going to see that in November and December um, in, in, the, uh, in the lame duck. Uh, but certainly, it's an exciting time, I think, to think of how we can, um, how we can get better in terms of uh, creating rules for the caucus that will allow an acceleration of, of uh, new voices and new people to ascend to leadership positions. I'm, I'm all for that. Jim Siegel. That was a very well-crafted answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Um, but just to reiterate what Jim said, it took almost 30 years for Richie Neal to become chairman. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's really too bad. And the Republican, the only thing, in my opinion, the Republicans mm -hmm. have done right is to set a term mm -hmm. of for chairs and uh, it, is, it has enormous momentum in the caucus, as you can imagine. The uh, term limits for committee chairs, I think we've seen um, how it's played out, you know, with, with Republicans and, um, you know, just this ability to uh, uh, make it more equitable across uh, Adam Schiff, uh, who is rumored to be um, looking, you know, when, when things do change or when the, there's an opening uh, of leading the caucus, and he said that he would be for it. Uh, and I know that that was met with uh, elation <laughs> from a lot of folks uh, in, in the caucus. It, it shouldn't take someone uh, 30 years uh, to, you know, go up the day as sort of to lead a committee, especially where it's, you know, something that um, they could be, uh, and they typically are experts on or have a, have a lived experience that will make them great leaders in, in that capacity. Do you have a follow-up? question? Yeah. Unrelated question. I know that there's a lot of attention on the supply side of, of energy. Mm. Are you giving as much attention to the demand side where commercial office space is usually 30 to 40 percent filled now because of uh, technological changes in the pandemic, and yet heat, I would assume, is still at the at a very high level. And I don't know what what can be done, but it seems to me if commercial can be lowered in demand, that there's more for residential. Which is yeah. Yeah, and I think we're all we're already seeing that. I mean, you probably could tell me um, more than anyone that uh, the way your offices uh, work is markedly different than it was in in 2019. Uh, and so some of that is just happening naturally. Uh, and they, anything that we can do, um, you know, we've done a lot of work, especially in inflation reduction on weatherization, energy efficiency, putting those incentives in place uh, so that that shift happens. Um, uh, I think the reason why you're seeing such, there's, there's a lot we can do uh, on, the, on the supply side. Uh, the New England Oil Reserve, uh, you know, the, the even adjustments to the Jones Act, which would help uh, New England. Um, Chairman Pallone has a bill uh, so that we can take advantage of um, buying low and selling high. Uh, so I think that there's something, you know, there's a lot that we can do, um, you know, just to help drive those prices uh, down this winter. Um, of course, LIHEAP is an important uh, step forward, but for, for, for businesses, for middle class families, uh, who don't qualify, it's, it's not going to help. And so we have to make sure that we're, you know, we're in a position. Also, just um, you know, making sure that we're not just in time buying, uh, which has happened in the past, you know, having our reserve up so that we have more supply and we can base rates on, on, on that, I think is important. So we'll be meeting with folks to discuss those options. Kathy. 
Thank you for being here. Yeah. And maybe a bridge off of Jim's question, going back to your concerns about workforce. Yeah. And just your candid assessment of the competitiveness of the Commonwealth. You know, factoring in the tax picture, factoring in, Jim, we were talking about this this morning, housing, cost of living. Um, what would be your assessment of where we stand on the national stage, given the fact that workers don't need to stay here? They have more flexibility than ever, given the hybrid environment. And thank you again for joining us in, a, in the virtual uh, period that we were in and giving us an update on what was going on. But your assessment of how competitive we are as a commonwealth. Uh, we are, I think, relative to most states, um, Massachusetts, New England, does an impeccable job of making this a place where you want to start your business, where you want to grow your business, uh, where you want to have your workforce. Um, we have to continue to improve on that. I think one of the things that got me really jazzed uh, about um, the Chips and Science Act was it's going to plow money into so many of the fields where we have a leg up uh, on the rest of the country. Um, the jobs of the future, the jobs that we actually have already built the muscle uh, on training our young people to do. Uh, we also have, um, you know, we've been in close conversations with not just our research institutions, but the Mass Tech Collaborative, uh, Mass High Tech Association on how to really use the cluster that we have um, to attract not just R&D, uh, but also manufacturing back to, uh, to my part of the state, uh, but to the entire, uh, entire state. Uh, you know, I think one, some of these you know, wars that are being waged in states that uh, were once competitors of ours for employees, um, you can't, um, it has an impact on you know, uh, a, a, a company's culture, uh, what they're going to say to their employees. Um, uh, in terms of coming and living there if women don't have uh, the same rights. And we're not just talking, as you well know, we're not just talking about uh, reproductive care and abortion care. Uh, it really does, as someone, a woman who went through IVF, uh, it impacts that care as well. Um, you know, a miscarriage care, uh, even contraception. And so I don't know as a state how you compete uh, when you can't offer those basic rights to, uh, you know, half your workforce. Uh, the other thing I think we, uh, one thing I get excited and when I hear Maura and Kim, uh, Maura Healy and Kim Driscoll talk uh, about on the campaign trail is reinvesting in um, our vocational and technical programs, our, our schools. You've heard me maybe talk about this in the past. My husband went to the Greater Lowell Vocational School. Um, I got a scholarship to go to college. We both pursued very different pathways. but incredibly successful pathways for us and having those lanes wide open uh, so that there are more opportunities created for our young people. There is so much that our, uh, our technical schools can do uh, to, to train workforce uh, without you know, uh, going to school for another four years or even uh, enlisting that debt. I think it's really important piece of what we do well here in Massachusetts. And, uh, the, this administration, uh, the Baker Polito administration, uh, has you know leaned in on that, and I think um, uh, our next administration is going to as well. But there is no question we have not figured out uh, yet um, what is keeping people out of the workforce. Um, you know, I think everybody has some anecdotes uh, around uh, you know young people not uh, coming to the workforce, women, and how we're going to get them off the sidelines, but. We should all be heads down focused. Uh, I know we are in the Congress. I can imagine, you know, the two big bills that we talk about uh, across committees. You know, I sit on the healthcare subcommittee of Energy and Commerce, and so mental health is a huge issue. And uh, we're going to—it won't just be one package. I was talking uh, to the the women at uh, Children's Hospital. This is going to take several iterations, and um, we're going to be at this for years. Um, but it's so prevalent right now that it, it requires to us all to have it front and center on our minds as we legislate. And then the other is workforce. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, you brought up housing and transportation, which I think those are things that we're going to be able to make uh, progress on, uh, given some of the, the, the enormous federal investment that, you know, we've seen uh, in, in the Commonwealth. Um, <clears throat> but we're also going to have to think of how we incent um, you know, 
workforce in some of these fields that are really seeing people uh, leave in, in droves, whether because of mental health issues or, um, you know, the last couple of years has take, have taken a toll. Other questions for the uh, Congresswoman? David? Jim, good morning, Congressman. Good morning. Nice to see you, David good. Ball. Um, I just had a question about housing supply. We hear from the people that we work with in our space all the time that young people just can't afford to buy homes here in Massachusetts. You know, uh, housing costs are high, mortgages obviously going up, rates are high. What, what can be done federally to try to um, address the housing supply issue here in Massachusetts? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. One of intimately aware of uh, being married to a, um, a real estate developer um, and, uh, and one that it really does take a whole of government approach. Uh, I think where the, the battles right now are you know, being sort of fought um, is uh, you know, in a lot of uh, local um, you know, town meetings, zoning boards, you, you pick it, right? There's a, um, uh, there's a need uh, for, for not just the, the feds to help with uh, funding and resources and programs, um, but for the state and for the local entities to embrace those programs. Uh, and so it's the number one issue uh, in the district I represent. And for those of you who don't know, it's Lowell, Lawrence, Haverhill. I go south to Marlboro, Hudson, and west to Fitchburg, Gardner. Uh, so we talk about transportation and housing all the time. Uh, you know, the ability to, for folks to easily and reliably uh, get to work, whether that's here uh, or just within the third district. And also, you know, housing, um, housing uh, um, anxiety is, uh, you see it across, obviously, workforce. Uh, you see it in student learning. Uh, you see, it, it, it's just, it intersects with almost every issue right now that we're trying to make progress on. Uh, so we need real solutions here, but I do think that we need to join hands uh, together uh, to come up with, with those solutions. I mean, one thing, it's, you know, when you're a congressperson, you have the power to convene, I would say sometimes the power to cheerlead, um, you know, when there is Federal investment, like what we're seeing right now, and I'll just use infrastructure as an example, there's an enormous opportunity to use that public financing funding to, to attract private investment, community by community, right? I see it with Lowell, I see it with Chelmsford, um, but you need everyone to kind of understand and participate. Uh, right now, we're all sort of participating in the national issues, um, but if you don't attract, uh, you know, jobs to or a new employer to your town, new housing to your town that goes along with that. Um, you know, your taxes remain high. Uh, it, you know, you're 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 fo you're not focused on economic development, uh, and so we need to make sure that folks understand that this is enormous opportunity, not just you know as a commonwealth, but also for them in their own town and to participate in that in that conversation. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, it's great that infrastructure has rode along with so many of the other investments that we're making, because sewage is a huge issue. It's a, it's a huge um, uh, bottleneck for uh, development, both commercial and probably more so uh, residential. Uh, so I know one of the things that we're working with is making those upgrades to the Lowell uh, Regional Wastewater Facility so that uh, not just the city of Lowell, but the surrounding towns who have flows into that can, can increase their housing stock. Uh, so to say that this funding that's coming from the federal government is coming at exactly the right time in the buckets um, that it's you know, uh, channeling through will, will help with housing and with public transit and, uh, and with you know, so many of the issues that we're, we're kind of faced with. You bet. Maybe I'll ask the last question. <coughs> oh. The, yes, did, you, did you have a hand up? Yeah, I have a, qu I have a question. Um, Michael Rubin, Aaron Fox. How are you? Um, question for you, it, in, especially in election year. Where do you stand on uh, insider trading for Congress? <laughs> I know the bill came up last week. Yeah. And it was postponed. And I don't know what you stand on. 
Well, I put my, um, I guess the, my money where my mouth is uh, a long time ago. Uh, my husband and I div divested of, uh, of the stock market. Um, or you know, solely in you know, mutual funds, it, because you can see that that's a step that Congress needs to take. Uh, there has been you know, lots of conflict of, of interest, and even the appearance of, uh, of a conflict, I think, doesn't help uh, our trust relationship with, uh, with the electorate. And so uh, I do fully expect the Stock Act to, um, to pass. Uh, it might even be one of those things that gets consideration in November or December. It's just one of those issues that um, uh, I think people have to sort of socialize and understand what it means, you know, for them and their family. And it kind of came up fast, right? The text wasn't uh, so, you know, no. Um, uh, those bills, I think everyone sort of is for it, uh, you know, sort of conceptually reading the bill and understanding exactly, you know, I think the version that is on the table right now. It's our senior staff, it's Supreme Court justices, it's increased transparency uh, and, um, and restrictions for many more people than just the US Congress. And I think that's what people just need to understand a little bit better um, you know, before that vote, um, um, that vote happens. Um, but I'm 100%. Uh, we'll vote yes on the bill and have already made those changes to our portfolio. Yeah. I'll just ask the last question. The, the Republicans across the country are attacking the Democratic candidates on immigration. Mm. And for some people that feel the Democrats are just not comfortable coming up with an immigration policy. And they really don't know how to handle it, but they're being hit hard on the issue. Your, your thoughts on how this is going to develop? Are we going to after the election, talk about immigration yeah. together? Yeah. I think it's the hope of every um, member of Congress. I mean, when I say that, you know, I work with lots of Republicans who are, you know, whether it's opioid addiction, mental health issues, um, we talk, I, I, and I have to ask certain questions, right? Like, could I, would I be able to work with you on responsible immigration reform? Because everything just gets swept up into the border as though that's the only lever to the uh, immigration debate. And we know it's a solution for our workforce issues. I mean, it's unbelievable how many people have been living in our country undocumented uh, and how many more people are dying to come to our country to work. Uh, and we don't, we don't talk about it in that way as uh, something that will just dramatically improve our economy, bring costs down for folks because we won't have the labor shortage. Uh, you, can, you get a signal, you get a positive signal on the other side, but it's, it's not something in this environment. Uh, look, we just had a governor go into another state because his didn't border and fly, uh, we, you know, con people into getting onto a flight and fly them to Martha's Vineyard. This is not an issue that they have any, um, any sort of uh, authentic um, motivation to solve. Um, they're using it as a campaign election fear tactic. Uh, now, that being said, it's been done before. Um, it's been done oh, probably while, while you were there, Bill. You know, the Gang of Eight got into a room and they figured out how we get closer to immigration reform. We have to debunk a lot of myths. I mean, just reading, uh, you know, what's happening at the border today, you know, 2,000 uh, folks from Venezuela entering or trying to come uh, to the, just to, um, El Paso on a daily basis, not illegally, which is what the news reports every day, not illegally, they're coming with a legal application for asylum status, which is something that is, is just being completely misclassified in, in the news and something we have to contend with because our immigration system cannot handle processing that many people. And so rather than having an honest conversation around like how do we put more people in place so that we can uh, resolve these issues in 18 months rather than six years how can we put folks on a path to um, uh, on a path to uh, um, legal citizenship here in our country so that we solve our workforce issues we've got uh, you know we don't have these crazy ballot initiatives around driver's license how do we do that um, we have lived amongst people who have been undocumented in our communities for years. And all, you all know 
Uh, all they want to do is have a better life. They're working hard, many paying taxes in our country, uh, serving in our, our military, and yet we don't give them uh, the dignity uh, and the and the compassion and just the the uh, the the path to a better future that they deserve and that our country has stood for for generations. So um, I will happily be a part of that conversation. I notice now the. The, uh, the levers that work with my colleagues on the other side. Um, and so I, I think that there is room uh, yeah. after, after election time and to, uh, to resume those conversations for sure. I know that Bill Stott is here representing Seven Hills, which is the largest human service agency out of Worcester, but in, probably in the state. And his CEO, David Jordan, has come up with a kind of a creative idea that as you know, in human service field, there is 30, 40 percent vacancies, whether it's in a nursing home, or it's in a group home, or there's people who are disabled who live independently. You cannot find personal care attendants to take care of them, and um, you know people who are eligible for a program um, uh, are put on a waiting list because they can be accepted in the program if they have a personal care attendant yeah. can take care of them. Well, a lot of those agencies have a 30, 40, 50 percent vacancy, so they can't take care of any of these people. Yeah. So one of the ideas that uh, the CEO of Seven Hills said, you know, we have the H-1B visa, we have the two B uh, B visas. Why not create a new category for human service? Yeah. And I think it's outside the box uh, way of thinking, but I think it's a very creative way yeah. of addressing a, a seriously unmet need out there. So maybe this is something that yeah. you should explore yeah. with your colleagues about the idea of, you know, long-term, short-term solution, how to address the, 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 the tremendous amount of vacancies in, in this field that yeah. people are hurting out there, that they just can't get somebody to come, you know, change their, their clothes or give them a meal because there's just not enough right. people out there. So yeah. Hospitality industry. Yes. Yeah. Hospitality. But it's really just an idea. a severe problem since my old district. Yeah. came right. from the venue. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, restaurants are not open. And, They're know, closing early. They're, closing They're only early. working limited hours. I mean, we yeah. see... Send a message to Ronnie yeah. Sanders. Send, send more to us, but please train them in advance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that that, um, that ploy, that stunt, I think, will, will, um, will actually have the reverse effect. Um, but I do agree. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, where in the economy, uh, whether you know it's our engineers, our doctors, our need for infectious disease uh, doctors, RNs, whatever, our you know farm workers, seasonal workers, uh, care specialists. I mean that um, it is a it is like the solution that is right in front of us. Um, I would say you know, we've been we've been grappling with this for. For decades, uh, you know, anybody who has a congressional office, we've got two staffers who, that are dedicated uh, to immigration issues, right? Um, constantly trying to unclog, you know, an application or to ex accelerate, uh, you know, someone's paperwork. I mean, we just need many, many more people who are working on this. I think the Biden administration has done uh, a decent job here, although it's not it's often not talked about, but this ability uh, to process folks quicker um, at the border, they are making some headway on uh, on these um, you know application times and just processing times in general. But it is going to take a core of people to uh, to you know reduce the backlog that we've um, that we've amassed over, you know, decades. So, uh, but it is an area where it would be an immediate solution to our, our workforce issues, no question. So we will. We could talk about an, uh, the classification of visa and then building up um, the workforce to, uh, to process those visas. I want to thank the Congresswoman for being here this morning. Thank you. Like a picture with the Congresswoman? Oh, don't.